All right, so welcome to today's panel, Exploring Open Education at York University. I'm Stephanie Quayle. I'm a teaching and learning librarian at York University, and I will be today's moderator for this panel. And this panel is co-hosted by York University's uh, Open Education Steering Committee and York University Libraries. Uh, so just as an FYI, I am, um, well, obviously I'm a librarian at York University, but then I'm also a member of the Open Education Steering Committee. So before we get started, um, I would just like to do a land acknowledgement. So I recognize that since this event is being held through Zoom, many of us are participating in today's panel event from various locations. I encourage all of you to acknowledge and reflect on the territory you're located on. My home office is located in Toronto, and I would like to acknowledge that the land I work and live on is the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tecoronto has been caretaken of by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. I acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. All right, so just some uh, a brief agenda and some brief housekeeping uh, before we get started with the panel today. Um, so just to let you know, uh, all of the panelists have been made co-hosts for the event, but then if you're not a panelist for today's event, you've been muted automatically. Um, if you do have a question and you would like to ask the question, you can always put the information into the Zoom chat if you'd prefer. You can also uh, use the raise hand feature in Zoom in order to let us know if you do have a question uh, that you would like to ask during the Q&A periods. Um, and we would be happy. I'll, we would be happy to unmute you for that portion of uh, the panel. Um, so just to kind of ensure that we have a respectful Zoom environment as we hear from our panelists today. So our agenda for today is: we'll I'll just do some brief introductions of all of our fantastic panelists. Um, I will be providing a brief definition of open education and open pedagogy. Um, then we will be hearing from our instructor panelists which will also include uh, Jonathan Watley, who's an instructional designer, and he's working with Deborah Davidson um, to produce uh, some OER for her courses. And then we'll follow that with an audience Q&A section. And then we'll hear from our student panelists, and we will also have a section for questions from the audience. All right, so let's move on to introductions. So our, we have a fantastic slate of panelists today, and you will be hearing from um, three York U course instructors. So um, you'll be hearing from Don Baisley, who's a university professor in the Department of Biology in the Faculty of Science at York University. Um, you will also be hearing from Deborah Davidson, an associate professor in the Department of Sociology in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. And you'll also be hearing from Matthew Dunleavy, a PhD candidate and course director for the Department of English in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. We will also be hearing from a few York University students today. Uh, you'll be hearing from Ikra Kib. She's a third year student in the Honors Human Resource Management Program at York University. Um, Cheyenne Gums. Uh, she is a graduate of York University's Bachelor of Science program. However, she may not be able to um, attend today's panel. Uh, she is actually located in the Netherlands right now um, as she is working on a graduate program in the Netherlands uh, at the moment. But we are hoping that Shan will be able to make it um, to just discuss some of the great things that she's done through Don Baisley's courses. And then we'll also be hearing from Araceli Ferreira, a fourth year student in the Honors Theater and History program. And then finally, um, we'll also be hearing from Jonathan Watley, and he's an instructional designer, editor, and writer who is working with Deborah Davidson on her um, OER that she's producing for her sociology course. All right. so. 
Before we get started uh, with hearing from our panelists today, I did just want to provide um, some very, very basic definitions of open education, open educational resources, and open pedagogy, um, just in case people are um, unfamiliar with these co um, concepts, and just to keep us all on the same kind of page here. So in terms of open education, um, open education is an approach to education that aims to remove barriers to learning by engaging in open educational practices in the classroom and through the development and use of open educational resources as course learning materials. So in particular, um, what that means is uh, today, you're going to be hearing from some uh, York instructors who are using open education or who are proponents of open education. So for example, in, from Dawn, you'll be hearing about her virtual field course. Uh, you'll also be hearing from Deborah Davidson, um, how she uses an open textbook for her introduction to sociology course. Um, and you'll also be hearing from some students and their experiences of working in courses that are engaging with open education and open educational practices. Now, you may wonder what are open educational resources? So open educational resources are free to use teaching and learning materials that are produced by educators and subject experts in the field. OER use open licenses such as Creative Commons licenses, which enable other educators to freely use, revise, and build on OER for their specific learning contexts. For example, they might be able to add um, uh, case studies or images or diagrams or something that's really specific um, to their particular uh, course that they're teaching. Some examples of OER include textbooks, course reading lists, assignments, case studies, lectures, and slide decks. Um, so in particular, um, I think you'll really enjoy hearing from Deborah Davidson and Jonathan Watley on how they are working together to create a new OER on the topic of sociology of health and healthcare. And you'll also get to hear from Ikra Kib and her experiences in using an OER as one of her main types of course learning materials. And then finally, we have open pedagogy, which is sometimes also referred to as open educational practices. So these are teaching and learning practices where openness is enacted within all aspects of instructional practice. And typically network technologies are used to enable faculty and students to collaboratively create knowledge and empower students to be full participants and partners in learning communities. So I think you'll really enjoy hearing from Dawn about the, um, uh, virtual field course project, but then I think you'll also be very, very interested to hear from Matthew Dunlevy and the fantastic assignment that he created for a fourth year English course on Victorian ghost stories. So students in Matthew's class got to actually use Scalar, a digital technology to annotate Victorian era ghost stories and write um, introductions for this material to kind of um, ground people in better understanding this content. And Araceli is actually one of Matthew's students, and she's going to provide some insights into her experiences as a student working on this course assignment. So hopefully this will just give you a little idea of some of the great conversations that are about to come up in a few seconds here. All right, so now we are going to move to the portion of our presentation where we will hear from our instructor um, and instructional designer panelists. So we'll just start with the first question that uh, everybody was given. And that is uh, question one, please describe the courses you teach that use open educational resources and also highlight any open pedagogy practices you use in your course. And so maybe we'll just start with Deborah first for this question. All right, good morning everyone. And thank you to the organizers, panelists and audience uh, for joining us today. So I'll preface this by noting that I am an OER novice. This is my first round. However, it is definitely not my last. I'm currently teaching two six credit sociology remote synchronous courses that run fall winter. The first is Introduction to Sociology, a first year course which I subtitled Now Streaming Sociological Imagination. 
There are several different versions of intro at any one time offered by different instructors with different approaches. And this is how this version of 1010 subtitled Now Streaming Sociological Imagination came to be and how it's a zero textbook cost course and zero subscription cost. Uh, the first part I'll describe very briefly is not new. I've done this as long as I can remember. And I get students engaged in each class at the beginning of class to think sociologically. We begin with a song freely available on YouTube that relates to class content, and then we debrief on that. For this intro course, I'm using an uh, existing uh, OER text Introduction to Sociology, Second Canadian Edition from BC Campus Open Publishing. BC Campus contracted a sociologist who teaches at Thompson Rivers University to adapt for Canada the OER sociology text originally published uh, by the OpenStax project at Rice University. It's important for me to use a good deal of Canadian content in my courses. We also use a form of open access content that might not uh, be uh, initially thought of as OER. Last time I taught Intro to Sociology, in addition to a full text, I required the required readings included three young adult graphic novels with social themes and diverse representation. Students connected threads from the stories uh, to threads from the texts and lectures. It was great but it was not zero textbook cost. So we asked ourselves, how could we deliver zero textbook cost while also bringing in diverse, relevant and accessible fiction or creative nonfiction storytelling? Canadian film and television has an answer. There are several sites that through a variety of funding mechanisms stream fully licensed Canadian film and television classics, including recent classics, to the general public without a subscription. The National Film Board, for example, streams on nfb.ca and also has a YouTube channel, TVO, CBC Doc Zone, CBC News, and commercial broadcasters stream on their own YouTube channels. Finally, an irreplaceable piece of the puzzle, there's a service called Encore Plus, a collaboration of Canadian Media Fund, Telefilm Canada, and others that host classic Canadian film and television on its YouTube channel. So what we did was we created a little Canadian film series an engaging mix, if we do say so ourselves, of documentary, scripted drama, and scripted comedy drama, including short films, TV episodes, and feature-length films, all by Canadian creators, sometimes a Canadian creator addressing a global issue. We made a crosswalk with film series content to correspond to each chapter and uh, each class in this uh, sociology survey course. As examples, we viewed two Canadian classic feature films, Mon Oncle Antoine and The New Waterford Girl, Social Me, a documentary filmed uh, in Toronto, The Chocolate Farmer on Global Inequality, Transforming Gender, Club Native, and Next Class 3000, a creative documentary short where Indigenous and Indigenous artist integrates archival film, contemporary film, and animation. One important point we believe we did well on is diverse representation, including BIPOC creators and principal characters, including several films by Indigenous creators on Indigenous themes. We also represented French Canadian society and, and culture, for example, with Mon Oncle Antoine speaking to the social history of Quebec and social me about uh, French speaking black Canadian women in Toronto today. I'm also teaching a third year sociology of health and healthcare course, no OER for any closely related uh, course content existed for this. So Jonathan came on board here too to reorganize and reposition other OER and open access materials. Further, we note some uh, we did write some of the content ourselves. I couldn't have ventured here without, without his support. So I'll turn it over to him now. Jonathan? 
Okay, so for sociology of health and healthcare, uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, we, we realized we could get so much of the way toward a textbook, maybe 40% of the way using one type of OER resource, 30% using another type of open access resource, and 30% using our own original writing that we added into the mix. Um, this is uh, sort of this is sort of like remixing, um, as is talked about in OER. Um, it's also similar to adapting, as an, a Canadian author might adapt an American textbook. A lot of the sources we used were American. We might take the basis of a, a, a paragraph or section from an American source and add Canadian um, data on the same theme. So three types of source we used. Um, type one got us about 40% there. We edited, repositioned, and reorganized OER material written for slightly different courses, like the health chapters of intro sociology texts, um, the health chapters of intro, intro social and cultural anthropology text. Almost all of that is germane to a sociology text. You're just going to add a bit of sociological perspective here and there. Um, the health chapter of a book on macroeconomics might be might have some points relevant to our coverage of health policy. Um, we got a lot of good material from an OER textbook on LGBT, LGBTQ plus studies um, and a lot from uh, at least two OER textbooks on uh, women, gender and sexuality studies or global women issues. Um, so type one got us about 40% of the way to what we needed. Um, type two got us about 30% further. Uh, we edited, repositioned, and reorganized open access scholarship and open access interprofessional material, um, not even written with student audiences in mind, but we selected and uh, edited and integrated it with the other material in ways appropriate to our student audience. Um, for instance, at um, the Directory of Open Access Journals or the Directory of Open Access Books, uh, you can find uh, excellent scholarship written for scholarly audiences uh, and released under OER licenses, um, typically CCBY. Um, those can be remixed with other material. So, some of the stuff is going to be released under a no derivatives license. You can't, although you could integrate that into course readings. Um, type three for the remaining 30% of the way towards a, a decent sociology of health and healthcare textbook is stuff we wrote ourselves, uh, where we wanted to scaffold learning in a way unique to our course, we, where we wanted to take a a perspective unique to our course, uh, or where we, uh, th or there was an obvious gap where the source material we got from types one and two didn't cover it enough. Uh, indigenous healthcare in Canada was an example. Uh, we wrote at least 12 paragraphs, I think, about that ourselves. Um, every open access re resource we pulled in from types one and two was written by scholars or professionals, almost always professionally edited, uh, typically peer reviewed. Type three that we wrote ourselves, we haven't peer reviewed yet, but we tried to meet the, meet the same standards of quality, uh, tone, and um, uh, yeah, quality and tone, and uh, student friendliness. Um, we didn't use any Wikipedia content that follows from that. Uh, we like Wikipedia for a lot, but quality control is sporadic. There are issues of editor or administrator or systemic bias. Um, but this is how we drew on OER and other open access, but professional quality uh, material to come to this. Okay, that's it for us for this question. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, I'll just turn it over to Matthew now to talk about this question. Hi, I'm sorry, I'm terribly backlit. I'm in the middle of moving, so <laughs> um, I've got not got a nice setup at the moment. Um, 
So last semester, it was just a one semester course. I was teaching um, Victorian ghosts um, in the English literature department. Um, a fourth year should be, well, is an honors seminar. Um, so typically that would be three hour class, sat down, small group, um, getting really deep dive into these works, um, which is not something um, you can replicate in the same way with Zoom and digital teaching. I was trying to make the class as flexible and accessible as possible. So um, I'm not gonna show it right now. I'm gonna keep my answer to question one quite brief, um, but I'll show it later. Um, the issue I found was finding um, anthologies that had all the short fiction that I was hoping to assign. So I would find some anthologies that might have two or three stories. It's, it's similar to what was just said about the, the OER sociology textbook of finding things in, the, in different places. Um, so I'd find one anthology, it'd have three stories, another one I'd have four. And by the time I was finished, there was just a stack and there was no way I was able to <laughs> assign that many books or, or get them ordered in time. So the idea was to create our own anthology and allow um, the students to become the editors of that, selecting which stories are included, um, doing the annotations, writing the introductions, and then creating the critical apparatus with their final essays. Um, and um, so that was um, the idea then was to give them some sort of public facing work, because a lot of the work we do in English lit undergrad classes is just between the, the course director and the student. And then it doesn't go anywhere after that. And maybe later on down the line. But there's some phenomenal work that gets sent to me <laughs> that I get to read. And then it goes no further. Um, so I wanted to find a way to put that in a space where they can show future employers or family or friends or uh, anything, anybody um, the work that they're doing in these classrooms, especially at the end of their degrees in a fourth year class. Um, so yeah, that's that's me for question one. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, Matthew. And I'll turn things over to Don now. Cause I didn't unmute myself. There we go, I should be, can you hear me now? Excellent. So um, I actually have been uh, working with open access and open educational resources for a very long time. So I actually have been using them in all of my uh, biology courses and my graduate courses and any courses that I teach as a guest lecturer. So I want, don't want to replicate what Deborah and Matthew have mentioned. So I'll try and fill in the gaps. But, but Deborah, I do want to say kudos for making everyone watch Mon Oncle Antoine. When my daughters were teenagers, I ran a weekly, uh, when it was my choice to choose the family movie, it was documentaries and they'd say, oh, no, not another documentary. And it was um, Quebecois films and Canadian films. So um, yes, it's a great movie. I love that movie. And um, okay, so how do you actually integrate the concept of OE um, everywhere in all of your courses? Well, probably the most important thing to do that most undergraduate students are not taught explicitly that I teach in every one of my courses is how um, academic knowledge is constructed. Everything from the peer reviewed process and journals. So what is a peer reviewed journal or um, a peer reviewed edited book to the gray literature? Let's make that explicit. Most students do not know that. And they tell me in science, you may be doing it differently, in LAPS, I hope you are making this very clear as to what's going on, as well as the difference between primary, secondary and tertiary literature. I also explicitly teach them about open access. What is a Creative Commons license? Um, what, is, uh, what is public domain? And one of the reasons for this is that, of course, when students give presentations, they should not be stealing images that are uncredited uh, for their talks. 
So uh, we learn about Wikimedia Commons um, and how to give, how to use open access um, resources in their work. We also focus on open access journal papers and they learn about how in the last uh, decade or so, funding agencies are requiring that um, data are made available. You can't publish um, in many peer-reviewed journals uh, that are in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics without making your taxpayer-funded data away. Um, so there is that, and, and, and we bring all of that in. And then um, uh, as a counterpoint to Deborah and her colleague, who I can't see, he's disappeared from here. Um, we actually have long done Wikip explicitly Wikipedia editing assignments um, in which students actually, uh, as I like to say, learning to edit Wikipedia explains to students why they can't cite Wikipedia in a research paper or a lab report because it's a tertiary source. Um, and uh, in fact, Wikipedia University has now created these wonderful uh, dashboards so you can actually register. In, back in the day, seven years ago, for example, when I started doing all of this uh, kind of assignments, um, and I've blogged and written extensively about them. I'm happy to share those resources. Um, uh, I had to sort of set up all the training modules myself with John Dupuy, who is another fabulous librarian. Um, but now through the Wikipedia dashboard, all those modules are there for student training to explain about open access and CC licenses. So I'd encourage everybody to check that out because it's a very, very powerful tool. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Stephanie, just to say many, many ways to integrate open access sensibility in education from the ground up at every level, first year, second year, third year, fourth year courses, and graduate courses. Because usually students actually, one of the things they often don't have a good handle on is how our scholarly ecosystem is constructed in terms of the knowledge content. I call it the knowledge ecosystem. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Don. Um, so we'll just move on to our next question now. So for question two, so what motivated you to start using OER and or open pedagogy practices in your courses? Um, so maybe I'll, I'll ask Matthew to go first this time. We'll try to change up the order each time. Um, so I think, um, Part of me adapting or, or, or starting to use OER open pedagogy comes from what um, Don was saying about um, creating an understanding in, in, in undergraduate students into how knowledge is created in the academy and, and, and the wider community and not, not creating this relationship where they are just um passive receivers of this knowledge um but becoming active creators these are fourth year in, I, and i would do it with first second third but in this particular class they were fourth year students who at, are at the end of the degrees and they're creating phenomenal work and it should be out there they're part of creating new readings of things um just because they don't have their ba yet or they've not gone on to a master's or phd doesn't mean their work is any less valuable. So I wanted them to, to create an understanding of them as scholars. Um, I've worked with the teaching commons for most of the time that I've been at York, either taking workshops or running workshops, or I've worked for them as a, as a tutor for the last couple of years. And one of the, the best feedback I ever got um, was from a packed workshop I did on open pedagogy. Um, it was just for TAs and we had some great conversations about how do you engage in open pedagogy within the limits of um, being a teaching assistant rather than a course director. And that, that, that got me thinking a lot more of, okay, when, when I am teaching and I am the course director, I will make sure I, I, I use these resources whenever I possibly can. Um, when I got this course and it was in the middle of a pandemic and I have two toddlers at home, I nearly didn't <laughs> because um, I sat there and I'm like, I, I can't do all the work required to get this off the ground. Um, 
but then I'm like, why I shouldn't let the students have a disservice like that and and then believe that, oh, because I'm busy. Yeah, we'll, we'll just let them become the passive receivers of knowledge. Um, and yeah, there was a lot of, um, and I'll talk about this later, about the advice, um, a lot of scaffolding you have to do to get these projects off the ground. But once you set them up, it's in the students' hands and they can do phenomenal things with it. Um, so that, that that's me, I'll pass it on to whoever's next. Okay, um, let's go to Dawn next. I'm muting. Um, so the question is what motivated you to start using OER and open pedagogy practices in your courses? Well, librarians and archivists, of course. Uh, so in 2010, I started working with Andrea Kosovic, who was York's first digital initiatives librarian who set up York Space, our open access institutional repository. And uh, subsequently, I've worked with many, many of my librarian and archivist colleagues on this. And I see many of you here in this meeting. So thank you all. Um, and I would say just uh, the first thing that we did was set up a digital archive for a long term ecological research project uh, that was done in outside of Churchill on the tundra in what is now Wapuska National Park. Uh, and my master's supervisor at U of T had um, had died in 2009 and we organized a conference to celebrate his life's work in lieu of a fest shrift when he was alive and it was so much work. Um, we brought together people from Queen's University, which set up this, this field station on the tundra. People came in. Um, uh, uh, people came in from um, uh, Europe, etc. And I said, "Wow, this is crazy! They are bringing together research from the 1960s. Uh, this is all going to be lost. All this information is going to be lost." How do we curate this? And the answer was to create a digital archive that was open access in York space, coordinated. Uh, uh, we could, we, so I learned the library, uh, Andrea navigated amongst all the different universities. That was where I learned that librarians are incredibly networked people. So if you need to get information out or get information in, um, always make friends with a librarian because they always know more than you do. So that is, it, it, that really is it. It was librarians that got me on to this and it's librarians that keep me going with why this is important. I could talk Great. about uh, breaking down access to knowledge and removing paywalls, but I think other people will talk about that as well. And I might come to that Okay, <clears throat> great. Thank you so much, Don. Um, and, and Deborah, I'll turn over to Deborah and Jonathan now. Okay, so our, uh, my comment is only on the OER because I'm not at open pedagogy practices yet. So knowing how cash strapped our students are, especially during this pandemic, I was motivated in both courses to stay save our students money with zero textbook cost as well specifically for the third year sociology of health and healthcare course i wanted to develop in a particular way to build a picture of the content from beginning to end and to scaffold it in a particular way students in this course come from a variety of disciplines so i needed to be able to situate it within the discipline of sociology for all of them to have them understand for example the social construction of medical knowledge the social history of healthcare uh, and the structure and operations of healthcare systems, uh, particularly within critical sociological perspectives. Now, I examined a variety of traditional texts that could be used for the course, but none of them built this course as I wanted it. I considered using a course kit with published readings, but I wanted it structured differently with more user friendly content and again, zero textbook cost. And going back to my beginning of teaching, I started teaching at York in a course similar to this via the old correspondence format, which was done all by snail mail, where students worked to, through the material on their own. And for that, I used a course kit with readings, but also as I wanted to 
develop a relationship with these students that I wouldn't see. I, in my course kit, I talked students through the material. And I think this also inspired me to build on this format, especially for this remote delivery format, which, which I had not done before, except in the old correspondence way. And now I'll turn it over to Jonathan. So Deborah's discussed how we wanted uh, the material to be accessible in terms of zero textbook cost um, and how we wanted the material to be accessible in terms of being student friendly. A textbook material is written and uh, written somewhat differently than scholarly journal material, for instance. Um, we're also motivated by how accessible these materials are to students uh, by platform. Students can access these materials. Um, the, the, the BC campus um, textbook from BC campus's Pressbooks server, um, the health and healthcare textbook uh, through the York Library's Pressbook server, very kindly hosted for us. Um, uh, for, from most students can access these from most connected devices from their phones, their tablets, their TVs, they can use text to speech synthesis to listen while they're commuting or working. Uh, oh, hi, Deborah. Um, you accidentally muted. Oh, oh perfect. So Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, start uh, how, how long have you been oh. muted? Since? Oh, it's just like maybe 10 seconds. Not, not too long. Yeah. Okay. Um, students can access the materials from most connected devices. Is that the last point I was making? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, including um, their phones, tablets, TVs, they can use text to speech to listen while they're working or commuting. They can copy and paste it directly to a Word file and play around with it and make notes and ask their own questions and find their own sources. Um, this has sort of high key accessibility to students with different learning needs and low key accessibility to students with any manner of different learning style or lifestyle. Uh, last but not least, another key motivation to us in the health and healthcare especially is the interest in creative challenges of cu curating and creating our own work this way. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. I loved hearing about everybody's motivations. I think I couldn't have planned this better because you all kind of brought out different aspects of what motivates and brings people to open education and open educational resources and open pedagogy from uh, showing students as being creators in um, kind of like the scholarly conversation we're having, um, getting involved with all the different partners on campus, whether it's teaching commons, the libraries, uh, also just making course content more accessible for students, whether that's accessible through the use of language or in viewing accessibility best practices and also affordability. Um, yeah, I, all those answers were so amazing. Thank you, everybody. Um, so we'll just move on to our next question here. Um, so what changes have you made to your use of OER and or open pedagogy since the start of the COVID-19 campus closure? How has it impacted your students? Um, so I'll ask Dawn to go first with this question. Sorry, I was just typing in to the chat that the Churchill Community of Knowledge Digital Archive content is used by biology professors across Canada in their undergrad courses. So just to say that we create this content and it radiates out. Okay, what changes have I made? Um, I would say that uh, the, the biggest one, and I still have an incompleted AIF grant on this, so feeling slightly guilty, um, was when I had to pivot a digital uh, field course. So last March, actually last January and February, um, the 16 Ontario universities that make up the Ontario University Field Program in Biology Consortium, in which we share spaces on all of our undergraduate biology field courses, which means that at York, we might mount one or two field courses in biology a year, but there's 30 field courses that come to the table and we um, make available one or two spaces on all of those courses for our students. So hence, I've got a wildebeest from the African East African Ecology field course behind me. This is a photo and there's a story to this that's 
relevant to this panel that I'll tell later. Uh, but basically, uh, all the field courses got cancelled. And I was the only, uh, actually, the, there was another York biology field course. We were the only university that pivoted to a virtual field course. And um, the commitment that I had to that was to, had with that was to make it as open access as possible, uh, just because we had students um, who were on the other side of the digital divide. And anytime you hit a paywall, it's another click. So this is about removing those, those paywalls and those access. And um, later on, I actually gave a panel and I'll share some of these resources. If Stephanie wants uh, a, a, the, the Journal of Visual Experimentation, which is a paywall journal, but I, they made a lot of their resources open access for the first six months of the pandemic. And we used a lot of those resources. Um, and then they went paywalled again. And, but when I did a webinar, for them on how to run a virtual open access field course, I insisted that all of my content that I did with them was open access. So we actually negotiated <laughs> a written agreement um, for kind of like a hybrid thing. It was it's been really interesting. Um, and so yeah, yeah, that's that was the biggest thing, and I'm still recovering from it and uh, the sleep that I lost. And uh, this year we're actually delivering those field course, that field course again, and Guelph University will come along and we'll teach it in parallel with York. And we've made it available to the other 14 university students who'll have to enroll at York. But, but we, we really took and sent open access in the field course experience because we have students who need these field courses and then they couldn't do them for two years now. Thank you, Don. Um, so I'll turn it over to Deborah and Jonathan. Oops. I'm, oops. I am now unmuted. Okay, so teaching, as we all know, teaching and learning is a very iterative process. So it, the one change that I made was that given that uh, the time zone differences for some students and imperfect internet connections, this is very brief. I just uh, started narrating my PowerPoint slides so that students could uh, ac uh, access the lectures uh, much more easily and, you know, at any time they wished. And Jonathan has something to say, I believe. Uh, in the health sociology course, we took on the challenge of creating about half a chapter um, toward, at the end of the course so it could draw from um, material we'd addressed throughout the course. Um, specifically about sociology of COVID-19. Uh, it's social implications as a disease, social issues of prevention, care, and treatment, um, implications of to surveillance and privacy, and especially um, health disparities seen in COVID-19 and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic response as an illustration of health in all policies. Um, these are themes we've discussed throughout the course. Um, we drew, we drew on a, uh, an OER lecture by uh, a sociologist in the US, Philip Cohen, uh, who did an excellent lecture that he posted to YouTube uh, under a CCBY license on health disparities in COVID-19. Um, we uh, adapted that to be more textbook material than, than verbal lecture. And we folded in um, about four scholarly articles addressing different elements of health disparities, surveillance and privacy, um, more theoretical so sociological thinking um, in light of the pandemic. And we mixed those together. Um, that's and and that's and that's something new that we wouldn't have created had there not been the pandemic. Thank you. Great, thanks. And uh, now we'll just hear from Matthew. Um, the main thing I changed was two two main things was originally I had the project set up using um, this um, platform called COVE, um, which stands for Collaborative Organization for Virtual Education, which is hosted by NAVSA, which is North American Victorian Studies Association. Um, so I'd been talking to them um, earlier in the summer last year, 
about how to mount this project, but they had some, they are open access, but they had some specific requirements about um, their editorial review process that it would have been impossible at this level and with the time needed. So speaking to Don about, <laughs> speaking uh, uh, to what Don said earlier about um, making friends with librarians, um, I reached out to the English lit librarian, Lisa Slonyowski, um, who, I've, uh, who I've, I've known for years since being at York and told her the project and said, is there anything we can do here? <laughs> can you help me recreate this on, on, on our campus? Um, so she put me in contact with Chris Joseph, uh, a digital humanities librarian, who his excitement was contagious and got me even more excited about it. And he threw at me a bunch of different tools. And we found one that fit, which was Scalar. Um, but then the main thing that we then had to change, that I had to change, was scaling it back. Take the grand idea. Um, that I had of these collaborative groups and the things that you could do with the project and narrow it down to smaller projects and um, calm, calm yourself down a little bit. Um, because that's what they were saying about teaching online during the pandemic was, if you can imagine what you have to get done, students just don't have the capacity to to fit that all in during a pandemic with and we don't know what's going on in people's homes or lives or family lives that they don't need more and more and more to do. Give, don't, don't, um, don't pull back on the education benefits, but don't have these grandiose ideas. Um, so it was hard to scale back. <laughs> I didn't want to scale back. I wanted to just do everything. Um, but I'm, I'm very happy I did because it was successful. And even students that had difficulties with the new technology they were encountering, were able to do it by the end of the course um, because they, they, they'd only been told to do a, a, a smaller um, part of the, of the platform, um, only work in this one little area. Um, and then hopefully we can expand when we're back on campus again. <laughs> Thank you. Great, thanks so much. So um, we will just move to our final question for the instructor and instructional design panelists, but I would just ask maybe you to shorten your answers just a wee bit so that we can uh, move into the Q&A section for the audience, um, just because we're a little bit behind time right now. So for question four, uh, do you have any advice for other instructors that are interested in using OER or open pedagogy in their courses? Um, and if you want to add anything to the chat in terms of uh, resources, links, et cetera, please feel free to go ahead. So I'll ask uh, Deborah and Jonathan to go first. I'll let Jonathan take this one first and I'll just write my comment in chat. Uh, often an off the shelf OER will meet the learning need you're trying to meet, whether it's um, material for a lecture or a textbook for the whole course. Uh, if one doesn't, you can often get X percent of the way there with an OER or some other open access material. Um, and you can get X, per X percent further of the way there with some other material, uh, either of your own creation or some other open access uh, or other zero textbook cost, uh, maybe under fair dealing. We're good. And I'm typing my comment. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I'll turn things over to Matthew now. Um, so very quickly, I'd say, if you're doing any of these projects or creating these projects is whatever you, whatever time you think it'll take you, it'll take you much longer. <laughs> um, so account for that um, beforehand and afterwards. Um, you, 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 th there will be things you won't, you won't imagine will go wrong. Um, the second is, I did a, a recap with all my students after the fact. And the main thing I pulled from there was when they were working on the project and they're just doing that, it's just text-based, they didn't, they couldn't imagine what they were working on. <laughs> um, it, they, they couldn't see the potential. Um, whereas once they saw the finished product, which I'll, um, I'll send a link to in the chat rather than pull it up now, 
that was when they, they they understood where everything fit together. So I would say early on in the course, show them what they're working on <laughs> before um, before they get to the end. Um, I didn't have a sample of the of a Scala project for this course to show them. I gave them other samples, um, but they couldn't see how this all fit together until it was in front of them. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll pass it off to Dawn now. Great. So explicitly, here's what I challenge everybody to do in every course in York University. Number one, uh, teach your students what the digital divide is, because um, internet access for education is a human rights issue. And teach them about that and net neutrality. There's a great John Oliver um, rant from a few years ago. Uh, teach them about paywalls. And um, there is actually uh, a, a blog post uh, that I've put in there about the importance of open access that links Andrea Kosovic's tweet from a few years ago about the cost of doing a paywalled essay. And I would say do a really simple assignment that will fit for any course. And that's to get them to uh, up, learn to use Wikimedia Commons and upload a photograph that they've taken that is relevant to their course content in some way to Wikimedia Commons in which they have to create their own metadata. It's a very low bar to entry. Um, a lot of uh, course instructors will not be confident enough to introduce a Wikipedia editing assignment to their course. There is a learning curve. I, I did it and it took me two years to work up to it with John Dupuy's help. So I would say that would be three pieces of advice. Great, thanks so much. Um, that was all excellent advice from everyone. Uh, so just because we're running a little bit behind time. Um, I still think we have 10 minutes now for audience questions, just because uh, we only actually have two student panelists for the next portion of the event. So we can take some questions from audience members. You can put your questions into the chat if you'd like, or you can also use the raise hand feature if you would prefer to be unmuted. And I'll just moderate that way. Any questions from our audience members? I guess um, if we don't have any questions right now at this point in time. Um, oh, so from Jenna, loved Matthew's idea of giving students agency to create and edit their own anthology. What are other ways the panelists have given students a hand in creating course content? That's a fantastic question. Thank you so much, Jenna. Um, Don, Deborah, or Jonathan, or, or, or Matthew, uh, if either of you would like, if any of you would like to respond. I, I don't really have anything else to, <laughs> to, to <laughs> add with that, um, only because this was the only project. It was a everything led up to this project for that that whole course. Um, so that's um, that's all I really did, except for one one part of the course to have them engage with materials in in a different way was using the the on essay um, as 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 part of as part of the course, um, which 
some students um, had a hard time at first of un unlearning the way they, they, they usually approach material. Um, but I got some phenomenal things, pieces of artwork, TikTok videos, a play where you could see students creating new things um, again, rather than just an essay that would sit on my desk and things that I hope I know they're, they're proud of. And you could see new ways of engaging with this material and ways that then weren't um, hindered by just trying to format to MLA standards or <laughs> whatnot that can sometimes be these, these little barriers. Um, so I, I guess that would maybe um, fit with Jenna's question. Yeah, that, thanks so much, Matthew. And um, I wonder if you'll be teaching your open pedagogy course again, or uh, workshop again for the teaching commons. I feel like a lot of individuals would probably be very interested in attending that. Um, it seems like it would be a great workshop. Um, Dawn, did you have anything you wanted to add? You talked a little bit about your Wikimedia commons um, assignment that you uh, like. Yeah, well, I had students do TikTok. Can you hear me? I had students make a TikTok for their science communication um, in plant ecology. I haven't seen their TikToks yet. They were all horrified. It turns out that everybody is a consumer of TikTok, but apparently at York University, very few people are creators. So, um, so I've done that. Um, I think that the minute that you go open access and you start to get students to do everything from post blogs on WordPress sites or Wikimedia, you start to create um, a, a knowledge co-creation uh, ecosystem because they can all see each other. And uh, one of the things that I always say about our students who are super prescriptive in their thinking, Matthew mentioned that, we, we, we're actually trying to make them unlearn everything, all these bad practices that they arrive in first and second year with from high school. So I'm always telling them that their high school teachers did them a terrible disservice in telling them they can't use Wikipedia and they have to use the passive voice and essays. Ugh, so much unlearning. Uh, because they don't understand that science is a process. They think it's memorizing facts from textbooks. Um, the minute that you get them to do all this knowledge co-creation, they're really shocked at how smart their fellow students are <laughs> and how excellent this, the, this creativity of their, of their fellow students and their peers is. And, and that, that fosters a really a much more positive um, learning environment. They're like, wow, that was a great Pecha Kucha talk that my, that that student did. I didn't think, you know, I, I think I got an A plus and they got an A because everyone in biology wants to get into medicine. So they're always watching the GPA. So I think it, that's really a huge benefit is they, 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 it generates a lot more respect for student peers. Yeah, that's, that's great. I, I love the whole idea of open pedagogy and kind of um, encouraging students to uh, become collaborators and cr creators of knowledge and just like sharing that uh, more broadly and then also just kind of really understanding like all of the great ideas that their peers are coming up with. Um, all of that's excellent. So we have a question here from uh, Lisa in the chat and then we'll go to Eric's question next. But Lisa's question is, how did your assessment strategies um, or assessment approaches change when integrating OER into your courses. So uh, Deborah added a bit of content into the chat around that, but I didn't know if um, Don, you wanted to add anything or Matthew, if you wanted to talk about how maybe you assessed an open pedagogy assignment, especially when students are learning a technology that maybe is, is a bit challenging. For I can just say that they give feedback to each other. Sorry, Matthew. Um, they give feedback to each other. And um, we, we build that in as a grading component. So a year ago, uh, 4095, that was before the pandemic, but it, well, it, it hit in winter term. But we did a film festival for applied plant ecology where we uh, went to Santa Moving Image Library and the students ran the entire assignment um, uh, including the submissions and then they had to vote on which it was something like choose the top 12 films you want everyone at York to see and they had to make them open access and stuff and it was about applied ecology issues and uh, basically I didn't have to grade it because they kind of did everything and they were quite surprised and generous with each other so that was good. Um, I spent a lot of time stressing to my students that skills <laughs> 
um, with this this technology um, would not be held for their marks at all. And if, if they had to email me 20 times to write an annotation, that was fine. It didn't go against them. Um, so that was the main thing was just to make sure that they, they weren't being um, they, they weren't going to be hindered by, again, if, if they had a background in this technology or didn't, so they were more comfortable, less comfortable on a computer. And then what I did was then I broke everything, all the, all the, the larger project down into smaller, smaller projects. Um, so one was just the annotations. And I think most people got 80 to 90 to 100% on that, because that was more about them just doing the work and, and, engaging with the text in a particular way that they just had to do it and then it was a it was a it was a pass um so making it as accessible and and inspiring as possible rather than the the worry of the gpa um was was my main aim and it, and, and it worked out it, people moved out to their comfort zones because they didn't have that concern sat there yeah, I think, yeah, that's um, extremely important, kind of removing those barriers and concerns. Um, so, oh, sorry, for some reason, the mouse in my computer is like disappear. <laughs> I was trying to unmute Eric here. Um, so, Eric, I just asked you to unmute so you can uh, ask your question now. Sure. Um... I am working on creating an OER. Um, I teach in the theater department and I, my area of specialization is teaching actors accents. And part of um, the skill set that actors need is to be able to identify words and what word groups they're in. And so uh, those are called lexical sets. I'm creating a, quite a large, if it was a book, it would be a large book. Um, I want to make it available as an OER to uh, educators and students globally. And, focus it on sort of global English. And um, uh, I'm working on this as my sabbatical project. So apologies to everybody that I managed to skip out on having to do remote teaching this year. Um, but uh, do you have any advice on the sort of iterative nature of OERs? Because I, I have this idea that uh, I might be able to sort of launch it, in, not half-baked, but not perhaps quite fully uh, what the huge dream that I have for myself um, starts small and then year by year kind of expand it out. Is that, is that, uh, this is my, I'm total newbie to the idea of OERs. Is that really part of the culture of OER that it, it expands and grows with time? Um, I'm happy to um, listen to your responses. Jonathan and Deborah. created an OER before. Yeah, I don't know if Jonathan and Deborah might have some advice. Uh, that that's that is along the lines of what we're doing with uh, the health and healthcare text. It's it's we it's ready to be used um, within a class, but it's still a beta test version now. Um, Deborah is teaching sociology of health and healthcare again next year, and we're going to refine it further, and we're getting closer and closer to something that could be ready for public release. So that's exactly part of OER culture. I think if you if you can take a peek at other OER textbook projects uh, on the website Rebus Community, R-E-B-U-S, uh, and you'll see something similar. Some of them have failed to launch. Some of them have launched. And you can see some of how that works behind the scenes. Yeah, Rebus um, is a really great website to look at and kind of like how they manage kind of like the project workflow in a sense for creating and developing OERs. And um, a lot of OERs, it, it very much is an iterative process where there's like um, maybe a, an American edition and then a Canadian professor adapts it and does like a Canadian edition of it. Um, and then even there's uh, classes where there's like maybe an open pedagogy assignment and then all of a sudden there's a new edition where student produced videos are incorporated too. So, um, Lots of great examples out there. And, and Eric, maybe you can reach out to the libraries and we can help out in some ways too with your project because uh, it's very, very exciting and sounding. And actually, I think we've emailed before about that in the past. So I am just going to move on now to our student panelists. Um, so we will just be hearing from two students. So 
um, Ikra and Araceli. And so our first question for our student panelists is, um, how did the course's use of OER or open pedagogy assignments impact your experience in the course? And Araceli, do you want to go first? Sure, I can definitely go first. Um, so I actually thought that the, the use of open pedagogy assignments uh, helped me engage with the content more, uh, especially because the way that we that it was set up for the class was very much like an anthology. All of this like uh, Victorian stories that we were looking at were all in one place. Um, and then you would upload your work uh, essentially, essentially using the platform and you were able to see everyone else's work too. Um, so it was very nice because sometimes like it's Victorian stories, so they're not very modern. Sometimes you don't know things and you're able to actually see other people's work and how they figured it out. Um, and yeah, I just, I thought it, it was a way of engaging with the material that I've never done before. Um, so I thought that was, it, it was a very cool experience. Um, yeah. Great, thanks so much. And Ikra, if you'd like to go next. Um, yeah, so having access to such courses, def um, resources definitely improved my experience. So I'm currently taking Introduction to Sociology uh, with Professor Davidson, who's here as well. And pretty much in this course, we have a free textbook and each week we watch some sort of streaming video. And it's definitely really helpful. Having a free textbook is always helpful for students um, especially in this pandemic, because you don't know where your student is and which country they might have money issues. They might have like all sorts of issues. So having an open access textbook is just great. And then the streaming videos that we watch, it's been so great because um, sociology, some of the concepts are not really easy to understand. So as soon as we go over the lecture and we look at these concepts, we get to see these videos that are related to whatever we just learned. And it lets you visualize and see these concepts in real life like you can see how they're affecting people in real life and it's been really different from all of my other courses so it's been it's been a great experience so far great thanks so much Araceli and Ikra um yeah I think that kind of showcases like two really nice um different points of view, like from a student working on an open pedagogy assignment and being able to engage with the material differently. And then I loved what Ikra said about, um, especially during COVID, having access to a, a textbook that you don't have to pay for, especially since we know there's a lot of additional financial constraints that have been placed on students, especially during COVID-19. Um, and, and then, yeah, I love the idea of like videos being able to kind of explain uh, these more challenging concepts too. Um, so I will just move on to the next question for our student panelists. Um, how was this experience different from other courses that use commercial textbooks or maybe more traditional assignments like the um, uh, standard kind of essay assignment? So Ikra, I'll let you go first this time. Okay, so I'm an HR ma um, major, so that means that pretty much all of my courses just have like these thick textbooks that we have to use. And all of the assignments that we have to do are pretty much just essays. If you can get an idea, just in my second year last year, I wrote seven essays in two semesters. So you can see how tired I would be of just the traditional format. And so in this course, all of our assignments are very different. We usually just watch, like one of the assignments we did was called the bassinet. There was this video and we had to watch it. It was based on societal expectations and the pressures that people can face. We watched it and then we had to connect. Um, we had to write a reflection piece on it and connect it back to our textbook and whatever we could find. And so this was really refreshing and honestly very helpful to get away from just the traditional essay style that we have to do. Um, so that was that's my experience with having it differently. Great, thanks so much. And um, Araceli, I'll let you go next. 
Um, yeah, uh, I'm not an English major. I'm a theater major and I'm a history minor, which means I, I, I um, for my major, I don't do a lot of essay assignments. Sometimes I do, um, but for my minor, I do a ton of essays. So having this kind of like new type of assignment was actually very easy, like not easier. It, it wasn't easier, but it was different because I was able to approach it differently. Um, and uh, Professor Dunleavy, he he was really great in giving us a lot of instructions. And even if he gave us a lot of instructions, I still had a little bit of trouble with the platform just because it was new and I had never used it before. But that did not deter me from using it at all because I would, like he said, I, I was one of those students who would send like 20 emails being like, hey, I'm having so much trouble using this platform. But uh, in the end, once you figure it out, you figure it out. And I think that's great that even though you have like a, a little bit of trouble, you eventually learn it um, as, as in all things. Uh, and it was actually, it was very great to have a, a less traditional essay assignment, especially because I'm in theater. Uh, and he allowed our like, in our class, like there was very, like not very few English majors, there were English majors. But there were a bunch of students who were from different majors and were able to use, utilize their skills from their majors. So like a lot of uh, the discussions that we would have sometimes would relate back to psychology because we had some psych students in the class. Uh, and for like the un-essay assignment that Professor Dunleavy was talking about, I actually was the one, I was the person who wrote a play because I'm a theater major. So that's what I wanted to do for my un-essay. And it was great because I was able to engage the material from my area of study and expertise. Yeah. I love that. I love how um, kind of having the flexibility in that assignment allowed you to take kind of like your disciplinary background or disciplinary lens and apply it to a new subject area and, and probably maybe helped you engage with the material a little bit differently because you had that freedom. Um, I think that's fantastic. So uh, we just had two questions for student panelists, but um, I will turn things over now to the audience if they have any questions for um, our student panelists. Uh, if you would like to either ask the question, feel free to raise your hand or you could put it into the chat. And Dawn has been adding some uh, comments into the chat about uh, Cheyenne's um, comments. I guess she will be sending me some slides and audio content uh, about Cheyenne's uh, talk around open access. And, and I can always distribute that after the fact to everybody who registered. I'd just like to make a comment if I may, Stephanie. Yeah. I'm so thrilled to be part of a university that uh, appreciates and and you know does these initiatives and even more so on our students who come to this with a willingness and an excitement to learn and i know that that charges me up so thank you yeah i think that is a fantastic comment um i I've loved to, uh, hearing about um, the variety of work that's going on in the area of like open education, incorporating OER and incorporating open pedagogy assignments into um, a nice mix of courses. We have some representation from social sciences, sciences and the humanities. And um, I just think it's really great that today's panel really highlighted how um, we can innovate in our pedagogy and, and our approach to using different types of resources across the spectrum in terms of the disciplines that we're working with it. And I think uh, just hearing from Araceli and Ikra, it just kind of shows that it creates a different level of engagement for the students. And we have a question here from Dawn. Um, so question for the student panelists. When did you first hear about the challenge and issues of net neutrality and the digital divide and how open access is part of the solution to making knowledge more open. So I didn't know uh, Araceli or Ikra, if you'd like to um, uh, respond. Uh, 
yeah, I can go. So just about the digital divide uh, in sociology, I think it was a few weeks ago, we learned about um, gender, not gender, sorry, global inequality and just social inequality. And in these chapters, we talked a lot about the digital divide that's happening and how not everyone in our society has equal access to the same resources or the same opportunities in life in general, and how um, the internet and just the digital media itself plays such a big role. So I think that was the first time that I really got to learn more about the impact that this is having, especially since the pandemic started. We didn't really have an issue that much before because everyone was just going in person. But as soon as the pandemic started, you're required to have access to a laptop or some form of computer. You're required to have a stable internet. You're required to have all of these sources that not everybody has the um, access to. So that's pretty much um, when I first started learning about it. Great, thanks so much. And Araceli, I didn't know if you wanted um, uh, sure. to add any thoughts on yeah, uh, I'm actually we learning about net neutrality in my technology and arts management course um, because we're talking about website design. Um, so that's where my kind of introduction of this kind of digital divide came from. But I think um, Ikra makes a very good point about how like during the pandemic, everything that we do, especially as students, is online and uh, like I know like before when we were in person, sometimes my like professors would print out stuff for us to read and they can't do that anymore. Um, and I know for like other classes, like my professor has set up a Dropbox full of like our sources um, because uh, they actually can't upload all of them onto the e-class. Um, so they instead set up a Dropbox for us um, just to have, access to all the stuff that we need to read for the course. So yeah. Great, thanks so much. And we have um, another question from Anna in the chat here. Um, so drawing on your experiences with OER and open pedagogy this year, how open would you be to selecting courses that would be using OER explicitly? For example, if York started advertising zero cost textbook courses, would you be more inclined to register for that type of course? Um, I can go. Uh, that would be a definite yes. And I think a lot of students would just agree with me because uh, textbook is buying textbooks is one of the main issues that we all have. Like in HR, the textbooks are like one textbook sometimes costs hundreds of dollars. And it's um, it can be hard. So if you start if York starts advertising, you know, open education and even just starting with just free textbooks, they'll see a great response because um, it would be really helpful for students. Yeah, I, I agree with that point as well. Uh, textbook costs are actually one of the things that I kind of rag on a little bit because I think textbooks cost a little too much. I understand why they cost that much, but I think that uh, sometimes it's very difficult, especially being a student. Sometimes you don't have all like the resources to buy so many textbooks. And for me is I take a lot of classes that are kind of outside my major, not like, like because I don't like my major, I love my major, but I like learning a lot of things. And if I have to buy a textbook, that I need for one like course that I'm going to take one time in my entire four years, then it's just going to sit on my shelf because I'm not going to use it very much again. Like I have a textbook from my first year that was probably one of the most expensive textbooks I got and was for one of my um, uh, mandatory science courses and I haven't used it since and it just sits on my shelf. Yeah, I think I think you make a really great point there, Araceli, where it's um, sometimes it's very tricky to justify <laughs> purchasing such expensive textbooks. And as a librarian, I like before the COVID-19 campus closure, um, I would see like the same students kind of using our print course reserve textbook program a lot because, yeah, some of the textbooks are so expensive. Uh, and um, yeah, and I support business programs and a lot of those textbooks are, can be very pricey, same with the science ones and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, it can be very challenging for students. And Ikra, I see that um, 
yeah, you said you have a pile of textbooks sitting in your, your closet um, and you're unable to sell them because of the pandemic. And that, that's a great point. Like you can't even use kind of the, um, you know, the buyback programs and that type of thing. And from Anna, we see, um, yes, she's thanking the student panelists. So that reflects uh, her experience in, you, in undergraduate courses. Uh, sometimes you want to buy the textbooks because you know you'll keep using it, but the one-offs can be very expensive. Um, and Dawn is inviting Ikra and Araceli to take her virtual field course, no cost textbooks. And they also send you an origami microscope, which sounds amazing. Um, yes, so I see that we're at 1223 right now. So if there's anyone else who has, we probably have time for one more question before I wrap things up for today's panel. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any other questions, but um, what I would like to do before we wrap things up today is just, I would encourage everybody to save the date of May 6th. So at the beginning of uh, today's panel, I did mention that I'm a member of York University's Open Education Steering Committee. And on May 6th, we will actually be hosting um, a longer event and this event will have um, a brief set of showcases that will also highlight some other open educational resource projects that are happening at York University. And then for the latter half of the event, it's actually going to be kind of like an unconference style where we will be collaboratively creating the agenda together. And um, we will be able to go into breakout rooms and discuss different aspects of what should inform your strategy um, around open education, open pedagogy, and open educational resources. So I would really encourage everybody who attended today's panel, whether you're a student, instructional designer, educational developer, faculty member, um, graduate, undergraduate student, I would really encourage you to attend because we would love to hear from everybody because we want this to be a collaborative strategy that is developed uh, with all of the different stakeholders we have at York University. Um, and I would just like to thank all of our wonderful panelists today. We were able to hear from just a really great wide range of experiences. Um, we were able to hear about uh, Matthew uh, really promoting open pedagogy and trying to engage students in uh, that collaborative process. We were able to hear from Deborah and Jonathan and kind of like the journey of creating an actual open textbook and all the different components that they're drawing on in order to do that very collaborative process and, and the different phases involved. And just hearing from Dawn's wealth of experience in creating open um, access and open pedagogy types of assignments, uh, her virtual field course, um, and just like all the different amazing work that I can't quite summarize that she's done at York University. Uh, and then I really appreciate Araceli and Ikra um, giving us their time and their opinions and, and just kind of explaining what their experience was like in the two courses that they took, uh, whether it was using open educational resources or actually uh, completing an open pedagogy assignment. So thank you so much, everybody, for your time today. I really have appreciated from hearing from all of the panelists. And yes, I see that there's a bit of activity in the chat here. So um, I will probably just wrap things up, but I will also download a copy of the chat transcript too. And I, I can share that to the registered participants today, um, just because I think there are a lot of excellent resources shared there. And once again, I like lost my mouse here. So oh, where'd it go? I said <laughs> I blame librarians for all my pedagogical open access innovation, Stephanie. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Don. Don is like, uh, I would say the library is like one of the biggest library cheerleaders I know, I have to say. So we um, love having Don <laughs> talk about the libraries. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. And um, I will just stop the recording now and